for the Passive House Retrofit Summit. We've got a great crowd here and, uh, and a wonderful panel of, of experts to talk about retrofit incubators in North America. It's gonna be a really great session. Super excited about it and that you have taken some time to join us tonight. I wanna give a big thank you to our, our sponsors of the Passive House Accelerator. None of the work that we do would be possible without them. Like literally we would not be able to do any of this work <laughs> without the support of all, all of these great companies. So please uh, include them. If you are a practitioner, include them in your work. Um, they're, they're very fine organizations. And I wanna give a special shout out to Zola Windows uh, for being our summit sponsor. They're one of the founding sponsors of Passive House Accelerator. And they've also taken the step to be a, a, a sponsor of tonight's event. And with that, I'd love to hand it over to um, Sam McAfee of Zola Windows, who I think has a few words to share with all of us. Got myself unmuted. Hey, hey everybody, it's great to see a huge crowd. <laughs> um, my name's Sam McAfee, I'm with uh, Zola Windows. Uh, usually companies take a sponsorship, uh, sponsorship opportunity like this to sell or tout their accomplishments and differentiate themselves from the competition. But instead, I wanna take the time to, to thank and congratulate all of you community of high performance designers, builders, and entrepreneurs for your commitment and uh, contributions that you made to transform the future of buildings in North America. Zola was born from this ecosystem and is a partner to your efforts. And um, we, we are the support team to your frontline efforts to make a change. And we wanted to thank, thank you for letting us be on your team. 100% um, of the solutions that Zola uh, offers are a result of these collaborations with our customers to solve design, performance, and budget problems. And our, our team continues every day collaboratively innovating along with each of you to keep pushing the boundaries of what is possible. Um, right, right from the beginning, Zola committed to only providing solutions that led to future buildings. That meant not watering down uh, product offerings with uh, non-airtight windows and to, to seek business models that ensured that the best performing windows at a competitive market price are an available option for every project type. And uh, after over a decade of doing this, Zola has grown its offering and only gotten better at developing pricing, delivering and uh, servicing and growing a portfolio of performance projects. And it feels even more important today as uh, we sit at the beginning of what appears to be um, an inflection point in North American architecture, where the culmination of politics, code, um, technology, marquee projects and product availability are perfectly aligning to completely alter the way in which every building uses energy uh, moving forward. That work has just begun and the efforts of this small community, you guys are, are spilling over into the wider building market very rapidly. It's a beautiful thing to watch happen and even better to be a part of the community that is making it happen. So thank you to everyone who's let Zola be on your team this far. And uh, we look forward to all the amazing projects we work with you on in the future. Uh, so I just wanted to say on behalf of Zola, congratulations to you all and thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sam. And, and thank you, Zola Windows for, for your support tonight. So I'm about to hand it off to Michael, but uh, to, to, uh, to say some words and to um, introduce um, Mary James. Um, Michael will be playing the role of moderator tonight. Um, you may have noticed that I've been muting folks a little bit during this meeting. So at the Accelerator, our, uh, we've been running our Zoom meetings as meetings and not as webinars, which means that they can be highly interactive when we get to the questions and answers. But it also means that it's easy to inadvertently unmute yourself and be making noise during the presentation. And that's okay, we're all human, if that happens, that's no problem. If it does happen, I will mute everyone and the presenter will then um, unmute themselves and continue in the program. We are going to have a very interactive Q&A session at the end uh, or after we've heard from the panel. So as, you, as questions occur to you during the presentation, please pose them in chat. Just pose them, do a queue and ask your question and we'll be tracking those. And then Michael will be fielding the questions and ask, actually asking folks to ask their question on camera um, during the Q&A session. So Michael Ingui is, uh, uh, is principal at Baxter Ingui Architects. He's also the founder of Passive House Accelerator. 
and he is a leading national leading and and uh, kind of world actually world renowned um, <laughs> passive house retrofit practitioner. Um, he does tons of retrofits of, of brownstones in New York, um, some, some really interesting and, and tricky problems that he's solved. Um, and he's a, he's a, a, a great friend um, and a collaborator on this Passive House Accelerator journey that we've been on. And he's going to say a few words and then introduce Mary James. So with that, please take it away, Michael. Thanks, Zach, uh, <clears throat> and thanks everyone for coming tonight. It should be uh, should be really great uh, to see all these different uh, individuals coming together and uh, talking the, uh, and just sharing knowledge the way we're going to, and uh, already having seen kind of the pre-show and and uh, just the conversations go that are going to occur and to just stitch all of this together. Um, it, it, it one of the ways that happens is is Mary James, and it's been great having Mary James with us on the accelerator. Uh, everything that happened with the prefab summits happened the same way where we did the first one. They're like, wow, we have to do a second one. And the magazine, if you guys haven't checked it out, uh, is really, it's beautiful. And she did a great job. And it's just, it's one of those things to pull all of us together, bring these individuals together and kind of stitch together what could be a confusing topic or in terms of kind of retrofits, such an important and emerging topic. Um, and just how what they're doing, how they're doing it, and what we can all do better. It's uh, it's essential to what's going on today. So uh, anyway, without any uh, further words, here's Mary. Hi everyone, welcome. Um, I'm very excited to be presenting this great lineup. But before I get to introduce in, to the introductions, I first want to let everybody know that the next magazine issue is going to be on retrofits and. I really want to ask everyone who's working on a retrofit project, no matter the size, your own home or a very large building, to please let us know about it. And you can do that in one of two ways. You can send an email to Robin, who's our newest research assistant at robin at passivehouseaccelerator.com. Or you can submit the project directly on the accelerator's project page. So, um, now for the very brief introductions, each one of the speakers is working to tackle the urgent climate question of how to make deep energy retrofits more practical and less costly. And it's very exciting to have everybody together here showcasing the variety of initiatives aimed at this problem. So um, starting off will be Betsy Agar, who is a senior analyst in the Buildings and Urban Solutions Program at the Pembina Institute, a Canadian clean energy think tank She's been leading the development of Pembina's Reframed Initiative. Then uh, James Gepner, a senior project manager with NYSERDA's Retrofit New York team, who bring, brings a wealth of experience in the development of new markets. Brett Webster is a manager in the Rocky Mountains Institute's carbon-free buildings practice. And he's gonna be giving a high level overview of RMI's efforts to scale up retrofits. Lori Rand, principal with Habit Studio in Halifax, Nova Scotia, will be talking about the Recover initiative that she helped found with Nick Rudnicki of RSI Projects. Beverly Craig, who works at Mass CEC on low and moderate income programs, will give us a scoop on the Triple Decker Design Challenge, which kind of sounds like a food to me. But um, Naomi Beal, Executive Director of Passive House Maine, will bring us up to date on what's happening in Maine with their 50 Houses Research Initiative. And there's more, a special guest, Nick Carver, Mark, sorry, Mark Carver, is a project leader with the Housing and Buildings Team at Natural Resources Canada's CanMet Energy Research Center. And he's going to be talking about their prefabricated exterior energy retrofit project. So take it away. Perfect. Just wait for my slides to come up. I'm just so excited uh, to have a, a, a panel that's almost half Canadian. That's pretty uh, pretty rare. So um, as Mary mentioned, I work for the Pembina Institute, and I've been one of um, many on a team uh, trying to develop this reframed initiative. I'm calling in from Vancouver, BC, which is also the home of the Coast Salish peoples. Just next slide, if you could. Yep. 
And I don't think I really need to, you know, hammer this away, but uh, in some cities, at least in Canada, buildings can emit nearly 60% of their city's annual emissions. And we think that, you know, two thirds to three quarters of the buildings that are standing today will still be in operation by 2050. The retrofits really um, that achieve deep carbon reductions have to be part of decarbonizing our economies. It's not just about new construction. The Canadian government has committed to reaching net zero emissions by 2050. So we really need solutions that we can deliver at market scale and really fast. Next slide. This leads us to energy sprung. Uh, it literally means energy leap. Uh, the Dutch are really revolutionizing the retrofit process by uh, applying modern production techniques to an industry that's really as old as uh, you know civilization. Um, if you could think about it as a, as a smartphone of retrofits, it's uh, the ability to address multiple needs with one you know, sleek, quick solution. And whereas traditional retrofits are quite disruptive to, to occupants, um, they can be vulnerable to weather and other delays, and they can also be challenging in terms of coordinating skilled uh, trades. Energy Sprong um, uh, net, net zero retrofits, uh, they have got them down to needing one day on site um, and needing minimal access to the units so they can stay in place with, uh, with little disruption. They have over 14,000 units um, planned. They've completed over 5,000 already. I think that that um, number is outdated. And the approach is now being syndicated throughout Europe and um, as well you'll see here in North America. Next slide. And just a little plug to my fellow Canadians uh, from west to east, uh, we have a, a reframed initiative in BC, Retrofit Canada in Edmonton, Alberta. You'll hear it later uh, under the project lead of Butterwick. Uh, Sustainable Buildings Canada in Toronto, CanMet, Mark will speak from um, uh, Ottawa on Pier. Uh, Recover, Laurie Rand will speak about Recover in uh, Halifax. And Ecology Action Centre is also doing an energy sprung uh, version uh, in Halifax and Cape Breton. And some of us are taking kind of a market development approach, while others are quite focused on the technology development. The, the point more for most of us is to really be uh, sharing our learnings with each other as well as to the broader industry like we're doing today. And just before I keep uh, going, we, we talk about deep retrofits as being more than a carbon or even energy um, a reduction. We're also really interested in all the other benefits that can come of retrofitting and living in better, higher performing buildings. Improving your indoor air quality, which is fairly um, obvious one right now, given how everyone's thinking about pathogens. Uh, but we can also think about pollutants from uh, wildfires and smog days that we know are increasing as climate change increases. Um, we're working in a social housing space, so protecting that housing. Typically, the older housing stock is the more affordable housing stock. Um, and we also know that there's a big opportunity in sourcing local resources and creating local jobs. Uh, in BC, for example, we're very interested in finding wood-based solutions for our forestry sector. And finally, we think that um, facilitating electrification goes hand in hand with uh, our grids that tend to be um, decarbonizing. Um, even in even in our um, dirtiest grids up in Canada, we know that we're on a trajectory to um, to cleaner grids in the near future. This is just a kind of a graphic of how we visualize what this might look like. Um, if you start on that left end and what you might think of as a light retrofit, uh, simple things like re recommission recommissioning, uh, simple weatherization. And as we think about deepening it, we want to think, you know, public health improvements um, such as those path pathogen controls. Um, for those of us on the West Coast and any other earthquake zones, we want to be thinking about seis seismic upgrades. And the real, you know, the, the reason that we want to talk about those all together Together as we think that these shouldn't be competing, uh, they really need to be synergistic when we think about solutions. So on to our actual projects. Uh, like Energy Strong, we are starting in the social housing sector, mostly because we have uh, multiple levels of governments in Canada right now who are interested in um, bringing up that social housing sector. It's been long neglected. And we also believe that those folks have been largely left out of the green building uh, revolution. The bulk of BC's social housing stock were also built in the same decade I was and in need of once in a lifetime upgrades. I'm not sure how I get that, but um, so it's well-timed um, with being able to kind of roll this in with how we kickstate our COVID economy or post-COVID economy. 
These are the six buildings that we have identified and secured for the retrofits. Uh, they're mostly wood frame. They're all low rise um, with the exception of one is a uh, concrete frame. Um, they m emit a collective total of about 490 tons of carbon and the utility cost for this set of six buildings is currently over $190,000 per year. Um, because of BC's clean grid, we can set aside the issues of big hydro. I'm sure everyone has opinions about that. Um, electrification could all but decarbonize uh, those operations, uh, but given the spark gap or the cost difference between natural gas and, um, and electricity, it really crushes the business case for fuel switching. Quite simply, we just we can't electrify without reducing demand. Uh, they just go in hand in hand. Next slide. So reframed um, is is actually tackling both the um, innovative tech solutions as well as that market transformation piece. Our program is designed to innovate on multiple fronts, including how projects are procured, designed and delivered, and um, in developing a, a business model that will really, you know, make these attractive on the market, um, in the market uh, housing uh, sector. It took us over a year just to secure our cohort of buildings, uh, but we see that as much uh, as part of the uh, procurement exercise as actually delivering an RFP. Um, we think that like building portfolio owners really need to take a new t a new new way of thinking about their portfolios. And if we're thinking about bulk buys instead of bulk buys of boilers, we want bulk buys of building retrofits. So now that we have these buildings secured, we are in the middle of developing or at the tail end of developing the RFP, which we're expecting to be out by this spring. Um, we're calling for design teams to provide schematic design services for one of the buildings, and they'll be participating in a collaborative design lab. So you could just click that one more time. This collaborative workshop, um, we want teams to be working together. Each of them has their own building, um, but they want to be discussing, um, you know, climate and seismic hazard risk and vulnerability, um, thermal comfort and overheating, preliminary life cycle embodied carbon, as well as the financial analysis of design alternatives um, in, towards defining that business case. In between the, the workshops, the design teams will produce the usual design analyses, uh, but they'll also uh, be working on these analyses that, that um, reflect the workshop learnings that I just, on the topics that I just um, listed. And the idea is that we get in early enough in their design um, process that they can start to integrate them into their outputs. Um, in parallel, we will be showcasing little known or new technologies uh, that we want teams to be considering for their designs. And picking up on Retrofit New York's idea to facilitate team formation, um, we want to be introducing innovators to, to the field and we're asking solution providers to signal that they're interested in participating in our lab uh, by logging their innovations at reframedinitiative.org. We've mapped solution providers who have registered their interest in uh, participating in Reframed on this Retrofit supply chain map. Um, and uh, we also have what we call the retrofit incubators mapped here on the third um, layer. So um, we're pleased to be joined by by everyone else here on the on the panel. There, um, we're really looking for cutting edge innovations in things like prefabrication, low carbon mechanical systems, seismic upgrades, as I mentioned, climate adaptation, and so on. And if you want to just click it one more time. Uh, if you have any questions or know innovators you think should get involved, please sign up for updates, uh, share and register your solution and join us on that map. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Should I just dive in, Zach, or? Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry, James. We, we gave you, we gave you a nice awkward silence there. Yeah, just, it's just my face. <laughs> <laughs> James Geppner. <laughs> Yes, please do. Please do. We can't okay, wait. Okay, great. Thank well, you. thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so if you could just jump to the first slide. So uh, I thought about, you know, what to say in just a few minutes. And, and I just want to see if I could give some context around our thinking about the program and, and give a couple of updates. And and I guess for, for context sake, the idea that just kept coming back to me is starting with the end as far as figuring out what we need to do. Uh, next slide, please. So basically, um, this is this is I think where we need to be um, if we want scale. Um, and when I say this, um, imagine this is much better than what you see in front of you in terms of basically a product one sheet. Um, 
you know, so here takes a typology, uh, you know, if you, if you break the market down into number of typologies and says, okay, that typology number three is actually a product. So let's just say a four story wood frame circa 1970s building. Here is a one sheet for that product. And it's a product with a known price, um, known outcomes. In other words, you get your, um, you know, your IAQ performance, your energy performance. There's a range um, that's presented to the building owner in advance of any design or other phases. So very early, um, I want to say discovery in terms of performance um, and price. Um, so it's a product, it's not a project. Um, so in other words, it's repeatable and the scope is defined in advance. You know, there might be some a la carte items like abatement um, or upgrades of energy service, but you basically um, have narrowed down the scope just like any product. Um, and that there's no delay in the cost or price discovery. There's not, there's not an exploration that's required um, to at least give a very rough estimate of what that price is going to be, um, basically to facilitate the transaction. Um, it's easy to finance because the bank already sort of knows um, the risks and mitigants. Um, they know what the performance is. There's probably a guarantee attached to the building. Um, and then once you have this sheet, um, you know, so it's applied to one building and you can go to other building owners with uh, similar uh, buildings with similar typologies. Once you have this sheet, you just basically go and say, we can do the same thing to your building. So this to me is what's required um, to have scale. Um, this is a, a very necessary element. So again, start backwards, uh, start from the end and work backwards. So if this is what we need to pre present to building owners, and lenders to facilitate them opting for a zero energy retrofit as opposed to a conventional upgrade that is much less capital intensive and delivers very different outcomes, um, how do we do it? And so to me, this you know doing this is imperative. Um, so this is where we're headed as a program um, to basically start developing use cases for a product, um, a product that fits a very narrowly defined market segment for, you know, like this example, a, a four-story wood frame building, um, and that very narrowly defined circumstances of challenges to be solved for. So I think that one challenge in this area is trying to solve for everything at once, as opposed to carving out, there are a lot of buildings in the world. We don't need to come up with solutions that solve for every single one, but come up with solutions that solve for a particular niche or sector. Uh, next slide, please. So again, starting from the end, what do we need to deliver this product? Um, we need a company that in our mind, um, that in our view um, can deliver direct to the building owner, that there are not intermediaries. Um, it is a replicable solution. Um, and again, they deliver directly to the building owner with a price estimate before further, um, before thinking about what might be the variables for that particular project. Um, and, and this company is a company that can um, invest in the development of a product. So in other words, not sort of wait until a project comes across the desk and then think about a design phase, but put early investment into a, a product development, um, deliver a guarantee, um, deliver a service contract, um, and again, be able to replicate um, from one um, building to the next in a very, um, you know, in a high volume fashion. So, so I mean, I, I think, you know, I'm putting this out there as a little bit of a challenge to this audience. You know, you might agree with me or you don't agree with me, um, but um, I think there's a lot of market analysis and information that needs to be collected to determine what is the best vehicle. I'm putting this out there. Please feel free to challenge it, but, um, but please don't just assume that I'm wrong without collecting more information. Like doing nothing is itself a decision. Um, I think this is the vehicle that needs to be going forward to basically have a scalable solution. And obviously we need to act quickly. Um, so next slide, please. So one of the things we did with our program is to just break down the New York state market. So if we look at the far um, left, um, you know, we have the, the seven different typologies. There's actually an eighth that's not included here, but in this case, seven different typologies um, that numbered and then the population size of the number of buildings in New York state that fit that typology. 
And then I just go through a really simple exercise where I assume a certain upgrade rate. I assume, you know, uh, a, a base rate that every, you know, building owners are basically doing equivalent numbers of upgrades. Um, and they do it once over 15 years. Um, and it gives us, um, that gives us the annual rate of upgrades. So in that first row, you see 13,000 upgrades per year for that one typology in New York state. And then just like, okay, so how many require substantial upgrades that might be able to put the capital on the table to do a full um, zero into retrofit. And so I just, I've heard that it's basically 85 to 15% split. So I just take that 15% and that far right column goes, okay, so in each market, here's what the potential market is to do a zero under retrofit in New York state per typology. Again, this exercise can become a lot, a lot more advanced and a lot more detailed, but it's like, okay, what does scale require? It requires that we size the market, segment the market, and be able to present what the potential market is for investors and companies to invest in the equipment, plant, technology to, to be able to deliver a scalable solution. So next slide, please. So again, let's start with the end. Where do we need to be um, by 2050? Um, we need to have, you know, we have this number of days, about 10,000 days until January 1st, 2050. And that means just doing pretty simple math, um, almost nine and a half thousand retrofits a day in the US. Um, that's, you know, around 783 retrofits per hour. So by the time this call is over, we should have been, we should have done 1500 retrofits. Um, so so basically, how do we get there? Just thinking that's where we need to be. How do we get there? Um, it's not going to work with the existing value chain and the existing supply chain. Um, that we know. So we don't need to sort of bother with the existing one anymore. We just don't even need to think about that as a potential solution because we know we need to act fast and we know it's not going to be capable of delivering with just even think about the time it takes to put capital together. Um, thinking about no other technical challenges, the time it takes to put the capital together, that is just not an acceptable uh, way of doing things. Um, next slide. So, you know, I really like this exercise. I check a lot of my work this way. Um, let's, just, let's just all um, imagine that it's the afternoon of January 1st, 2050, and we didn't meet our goal. We didn't retrofit the 120 million or so um, buildings in the US that need to be retrofitted. Um, we failed. Okay, so why? I really think this is a good exercise to do. Um, so, and, and really spend time to think through this question. And, and you know, when I've, when I've had conversations, um, you know, there tends to be, it is, it is a human, um, it is a human tendency to go what those people aren't doing. Um, what is not going right out there? You know, so you might initially think technical challenges, policy actions, societal priorities, um, certain information that's not widely known about the, like the necessity of high, high air quality, um, knowledge of health benefits. So these, I assume, would all be on your list, you know, practices by lenders or insurers. Um, so, so those are all good. And I, I do really do recommend that everyone thinks through this. Um, but with all things, you know, we need to, you know, follow the advice of the Stoics and think about what's in our control and what's outside of our control. It's good to know those sort of policy actions and code changes that might be required, but what are the things within your control? You, um, what can you do? This is the hard part, um, and, but we're all always better off when we do it. Um, so I think this is, again, I think this is a really important exercise to go through. Um, once you, um, you know, find that knowledge, then you can really say, okay, here's how I can act. Um, and there's kind of less anxiety about um, whether or not you can get to the solution because you already know you're doing everything possible. So, you know, once you come up with items, then put it in the calendar, block out time to do that because then it'll actually occur. Um, next slide, please. So, um, so basically, you know, our thought with our program um, is, and, and we'll be releasing some uh, requests for qualifications that start to drive some coordination in the industry around this type of ent entity. And we'll also have our next round of demonstration projects that will seek to build our first um, use cases for a scalable approach to retrofits. Um, but here are some things um, that, you know, you might have different items on your list, but just I wanted to throw some out there. Um, I think 
architects and engineers, particularly, these are might be valuable actions. So, um, you know, these are, again, there's a current structure to um, this industry. And what we know for a fact is that it won't work here. So, you know, fee for service, for example, I think will continue, but is that gonna be the answer for scalable retrofits? I don't think so, no. Um, so people's willingness to kind of expand even their business model as they think about what are the required steps to, to scale to retrofits, I think is really important. Um, and again, you know, when we think about those numbers, these decisions really are key to having uh, a lot of impact. So the decisions that you make are obviously incredibly important. I think everyone here knows that. Um, next slide, please. So then there's the, you know, the flip side of that same exercise. It's the afternoon of January 1st, 2050, and we succeeded. Um, what did you do that made that happen? What are the really wise steps that you took um, to um, make that come about? And what contributions did you make that became like a domino that started to compound upon one another and really started to make things happen? Um, so with that thought, um, you know, we've been moving, when I say we, I mean, everyone in this community have been moving really fast for the last couple of years and gaining momentum. Um, so I'd like to see that continue. And, and I think the question, um, for me, the question of what needs to be done is a thing of the past. Um, it's really, how do we implement? How quickly can we implement? How do we scale? Um, and so with that, thank you very much for uh, having me. Thank you, James. And uh, th th I also want to give a shout out to NYSERDA for uh, being a stakeholder partner of the Accelerator and supporting so much of our work. Thank you. So Brett Webster, you're up next. All right, great. Thanks, Zach. Um, hi, everyone. It's really great to be here. Great to see so many folks uh, in attendance. I'm going to uh, uh, be giving a high level update on the various prongs of the Realize initiative at RMI. Um, I think some very brief background is that Realize was formed about five years ago, inspired like many of the organizations on the panel tonight by Energy Sprong in the Netherlands. Um, much of our work thus far has been focused on adapting Energy Sprong to affordable multifamily housing in the U.S. Um, recently, our initiative has expanded and morphed in a few different ways. And so I plan to give a sort of update on where things are at with Realize and what we're up to. Uh, I will preface that this is undoubtedly going to be a bit of a whirlwind tour, but I will try to keep things concise and moving forward. And uh, if there's pieces folks are interested in digging into, hopefully we can get into some of that in the discussion. So next slide, please. Uh, great, so these are the four areas I'm gonna focus on. The first is the Advanced Building Construction Collaborative. Uh, which is an initiative um, that we are working on in partnership with DOE and many others. Um, the second is uh, Zero Over Time, uh, which is an approach to portfolio planning that I'll discuss in, in a bit of detail. Uh, the third is around our efforts, um, our R&D efforts to bring to market the types of solutions we think need to be out there to meet the retrofit challenges that some of the other panelists have discussed. And the fourth is really around scaling the core realized programs that have been aimed at, um, or the original realized programs rather, that have been aimed at uh, affordable multifamily uh, segment. Next slide, please. So Advanced Building Construction Initiative at DOE um, is really aimed at accelerating a transition, a market transformation to uh, high performance technologies that could ensure uh, new buildings and retrofits have uh, superior comfort, resiliency, low carbon footprints, fast on-site construction timelines. They're affordable to developers and consumers measured by sort of a lifetime value outweighing a lifetime cost and are appealing to owners and occupants. So in support of this trend, the Advanced Building Construction Collaborative uh, that RMI leads in partnership with DOE and ADL Ventures um, brings together an array of building industry stakeholders to help accelerate the mainstream adoption of these innovative high-performance technologies and practices. Um, next slide, please. 
so the ultimate goal is to decarbonize the, the built environment in the US by 2050. Um, to do this, we need all construction to be zero carbon immediately. And we need our current retrofit rate of around 1% of the building stock per year to ramp up by an order of five or six times and to go all the way to zero carbon or zero carbon ready with each retrofit. So aligned with that vision, um, the ABC Collaborative has created these sort of 20, 30 milestones where we'd like to see 3 million uh, net zero retrofits a year and have industrialized construction uh, representing 25% of the market and um, ABC technologies as sort of previously defined uh, are sort of widely in use um, across the industry. Next slide, please. Um, so the ABC Collaborative is working to organize the market towards these ends by focusing on four key areas that are shown on this slide. Um, and I'm not gonna do a deep dive here, but you know, just briefly talking through these, um, the idea is to organize demand through uh, the kind of market sizing and segmentation that James referenced, um, and then engage with a variety of the demand side stakeholders um, to work with the supply side to better be able to deliver uh, these types of prefabricated high performance technologies at scale uh, to align the market enablers and shapers, including governments, um, lenders, trade associations, codes and standards, um, pl industry players like that, and then to further accelerate R&D efforts and go to market strategy strategies to get more of these innovative high performance technologies out on the market. Um, next slide, please. All right, so that's the ABC uh, initiative and the ABC collaborative. I'm gonna shift over to uh, zero over time, which is an approach that um, RMI released a report about um, three years ago or so. And we have since um, invested uh, and are continuing to invest time and resources in helping to build out a tool that's really aimed at portfolio, creating an investment plan for portfolio owners. And our goal or angle with this tool is really to streamline the snowflake syndrome that pervades the retrofit market, where each building is its own snowflake and we need a huge amount of in-depth analysis and audit and uh, to create unique solutions for that building. We gotta get away from that if we're gonna achieve the kind of scale we need. And so. The zero over time approach um, helps analyze uh, buildings across a portfolio in one fell swoop, identify measures or retrofit solutions based on the specific conditions of each building, but without doing an ASHRAE level two audit at each building, identify the right timing in the building life cycle to implement those solutions and the right financing instrument um, to, to pair the solutions with that timing event. The idea is that all of these would be plotted on what we call a zero over time calendar that basically serves as, a, as an investment roadmap for the building owner. Um, I think I'm gonna leave it there. So uh, next slide, please. One of the core ideas of the zero over time approach is this idea of trigger events that all buildings in their life cycle or within a portfolio have various trigger events where a retrofit intervention, especially a zero carbon retrofit, retrofit intervention would be optimally timed. And so some of these events include, you know, planned equipment upgrades or replacements or major rehabs or tenant turnover, building acquisitions or sales and other capital events like refinancing. And so to be able to plot out across a portfolio uh, where these events occur for each building and identify the sort of engineering solutions that um, help pave the way or, or create a kind of net zero package, um, then we can get at this zero over time calendar that, that I referenced. And so a lot of our work is going into building out this tool to be able to uh, streamline customer acquisition and then aggregate demand for the same types of solutions 
across portfolios um, so that we can help, you know, further drive down costs through signaling demand to manufacturers, as well as bulk procurement and things like that. Next slide, please. Um, so we also have pilot demonstrations underway um, in Massachusetts and California, uh, where we are trying out and getting on the ground experience with some of these types of solutions. Pictured here is the Eva White building uh, in Boston, which is a mid-rise apartment building uh, that is currently undergoing a RAD conversion. We selected this building through a Department of Energy Award because it is representative of, the, of a ubiquitous mid-rise typology throughout the Northeastern US. Um, concrete mass wall construction, uninsulated single pane windows, old boiler plants serving in apartment radiators with tenant owned ACs, um, totally heating dominated as you can see by the, the baseline energy use in the upper right there. Um, so we are working closely with wind companies to implement a realized retrofit of this building. And by realized retrofit, I also mean energy sprung style or ABC style or retrofit New York style or Pembina style, any number. I think we're all sort of speaking the same language here. Um, we are currently have, are just wrapping up, the project is currently just wrapping up uh, schematic design and costing with a goal of starting construction at the end of this year or early next year. Um, the projections for site energy savings are around 65%. Um, you can see from that upper right graph and then the lower right graph shows sort of the GHG emissions over time, uh, which are about a 70% carbon reduction by 2035 if we assume Massachusetts meets its renewable electricity goals. Uh, next slide, please. Some of our other R&D work in this area is really aimed at mechanical systems and thinking about ways to package mechanical solutions in easier to deploy uh, form factors that are kind of uh, conducive to a retrofit in place or occupied rehab. Um, so shown on the left is a low eyes solution we're working on in partnership with uh, System Air. Um, who already makes uh, a genius mechanical module is the, the name of it, uh, which pictured here. And we're working with them to adapt this module um, to low rise multifamily buildings in California. Uh, and this kind of delivers the full suite of, of mechanical services, domestic hot water, um, space heating and cooling and heat recovery ventilation. Uh, shown on the right is a mid-rise solution um, for buildings with existing central plants. Uh, we're working with uh, Stangle Engineering and TK Fabricate in New York to, uh, to fabricate these um, sort of packaged pods that would sit in apartments and be designed to be connected with a central plant, but would have make for sort of easy connections and able to deliver um, heat recovery, ventilation, space conditioning, and uh, in this sort of, you know, slim, uh, easy to deploy sort of package. Next slide, please. We are also uh, have R&D going on on the envelope side. Um, one of the challenges we've run into with low rise wood framed buildings, uh, we've been working with RDH Building Science to assess the kind of structural integrity of that type of multifamily building. And one of the big learnings has been that many of the existing multifamily buildings, at least in California, and I think similarly elsewhere, can really only support a retrofit panel of around four pounds a square foot. So some of our work has been geared at um, developing a lightweight non-structural panel with a, with a streamlined system for integrating windows and doors, um, as well as a streamlined sort of point cloud scan to manufacturing process. Um, and then for those buildings, like the concrete buildings such as Eva White, or those where a seismic retrofit may be needed, we've been doing some work on these sort of larger um, structural panels that are unitized with windows and doors pre-integrated. Okay, I think I'm running low on time here, so I will try to wrap it up. Next slide. Um, so then, uh, uh, actually, if you can go, 
Well, I can actually stay here. Yeah. So that um, we're um, so the last piece of the puzzle that realize going on these days is really thinking about scaling up regional programs to deliver um, zero carbon multifamily retrofits. And sort of our flagship program that's currently underway is in California, where um, we are working to operationalize this type of retrofit program across the state. Next slide. And that work has started with a lot of the typology assessment around what are the most ubiquitous typologies that we need solutions for. Um, both in terms of size, in terms of structure, in terms of, in terms of existing mechanical systems, in terms of vintage, and then um, to identify solutions that can work for each of, these, each of these typologies. Next slide, please. So this just shows the California mechanical typology results and the next slide. And then ultimately the vision is to have, you know, a regional realized program be able to uh, offer a, um, you know, zero over time planning tool that creates a pipeline of demand uh, for manufacturers, and then is able to deliver standardized retrofit packages for buildings where those are appropriate. Um, zero carbon retrofits with minimal disruption, streamlined financing, and then the performance guarantee that James was referencing that can help um, mitigate performance risk and ideally make lenders more willing to underwrite higher percentages of expected savings. Next steps for us include scaling these programs to the Northeast. Um, we have sort of nascent uh, steps in, in Massachusetts and Pennsylvania to, uh, to kind of replicate what, has, what is currently going on in California in those locations. Sorry for running long there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brett. That was fantastic. So next up, we have Lori Rand from Recover. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, great. Uh, so quickly, first, I'm just going to give you a little geography lesson. So the Recover initiative is based in Halifax in Nova Scotia. So uh, you can jump forward. And we're on the East Coast. And if we jump a little bit closer, you'll see that uh, Nova Scotia is surrounded by o ocean. Oh, the slides clipped a little. Uh, so surrounded by ocean and uh, we're almost an island and probably someday will be an island. Um, we have just under a million people and almost everyone lives within 20 kilometers of the coast. And we know that we're on a, an irreversible path to sea level rise. Next. So about a year ago, my colleagues Nick and Emma and I somehow persuaded the province of Nova Scotia to give us money to study um, doing an energy sprung demonstration project here in Halifax. And when they did that after relentless hounding on our part, we weren't actually prepared to take the money. So we ended up doing it under, as a sort of incubator under Quest Canada's umbrella. Um, Quest Canada is a nonprofit that Emma uh, works for and they, uh, they work with municipalities to develop smart energy plans. Next. And so that's the building we studied. And largely we studied that building because it fit the criteria. It's a four-story MERB, similar to uh, what Brett was just talking about, or James. Um, and it is ubiquitous building type. And we really set out to look at MERBs because we felt that it would benefit the most people quickly. This building is about 40 years old and is heated by an oil-fired boiler, which is very common in Nova Scotia. More than half of our buildings are heated with oil. Next. So our goals with the pilot study were to develop a process that would be scalable, repeatable, and efficient. And we were aiming for one air change per hour. And we wanted it to be net zero although we would have settled for net zero ready if the solar potential wasn't there. 
We also wanted to develop a, a process or a, a strategy that would be carbon storing rather than high in embodied carbon. We did not want to contribute to run evictions because that is prevalent in our city. And whatever solution we came up with needed to be regionally sourced and locally made. And finally, we set out to um, be open source about everything because we know that there's we could work on the retrofit problem for the rest of our careers and not be finished. So we need to recruit everybody to the cause. Next. So the first thing we did is a LiDAR scan and uh, the image on the right of the screen is the point cloud that was generated by the scan. Uh, next. And when you do a LiDAR scan, you, uh, you very quickly come up with a drawing that looks like you can work with it, but you can see that um, you have a lot of points and grainy kind of smudges on in the output and it is quite technically challenging to turn that into a drawing like the one on the right that you can actually work from. So while we have the, um, you know, the LiDAR speeds us up in the measuring side of things, there is a bit of a technical leap that needs to happen with the step of getting to uh, working drawings from that. Next. We studied three panel options for the retrofit, all of them with about the same R value and all of them would have uh, local Passive House certified windows. Uh, we were always rooting for the um, cellulose based solution, but we felt that it was prudent to study other options. And so we looked at foam panels, uh, basically SIPs, and also insulated metal panels. And basically because both of those options were kind of already available. Next. And uh, kind of evaluated each of those options based on cost and complexity and uh, and particularly, we've probably spent the most time with Woofy analysis because you probably noticed it's a brick building. So um, we didn't want to cause any problems by covering up uh, brick and, and making headaches down the road. Um, and we did find that uh, using cellulose on the roof was problematic. And our short term solution was to propose using uh, basically dense glass sheathing, but I think that if, as we go forward with the demonstration build, we'll probably reassess that. And after all of that, we, we decided that yes, the cellulose based panel was the right choice. Next. We did spend quite a bit of time crunching the numbers on the carbon math and we did that using the resources you see on the right. So the Phyllis database, uh, Builders for Climate Actions, a great uh, carbon calculator, which at the time was a beta, but now you can actually get the real version. And also the EC3 uh, database. And we found that just in the new building materials, by going with the cellulose option, we store 76 tons of CO2e in the building materials. It would actually be more. We, uh, we decided to go with metal siding instead of wood siding because metal saved uh, nearly 90 grand over the lifetime of the building. And so um, we made a small compromise. Next. And if we calculated, uh, well, we did calculate the, this, the carbon stored in the existing building. And just in the timber, there is 57 tons of CO2E stored. Um, and that doesn't include the brick and the concrete, which um, we weren't quite up to figuring that out conclusively. Next. So, I'm just gonna go quickly through um, some nerdy building details. The idea for the roof is that the panels will span from the whole way across 
the building because we don't know about the um, bearing capacity of the footings, the internal footings. And so uh, from side to side, the, the new roof panels will extend out and over the wall panels and the wall panels will kind of be suspended from those. And then at the bottom, at the foundation, um, the, there will be sort of intermittent brackets that the bottom of the Larson truss will, will bear on and be fastened back into the foundation. Next. And we're basically making giant tongue and groove panels. Um, and the, that's the corner detail that you see on the right. Next. And we're planning, at least currently planning, to um, to span the full height of the building. It's not a super tall building. And the panel layout will be, uh, as best as possible, we'll be doing eight foot segments. And you can see we've sort of, we're, we're looking at uh, using, basing the positions on where the windows are. Next. And so the window bucks will uh, secure the panels to the building in the field, but where we have panels that don't have windows, we'll actually select mm. strategically remove uh, bricks at the at the floor plates and fasten uh, brackets back into the structure. Next, we also looked at three HVAC options. The tenants in this building already had cooling through mini split heat pumps, so we didn't feel like we could take those away from them, even though it's probable that they won't need them anymore once this work is done. All of the options, all of the mechanical options uh, took the building to net zero because we found that we can use a PV array. Um, so uh, we looked at, for heat, we looked at uh, replacing the uh, electric baseboards, or rather the, the hot water baseboards with electric baseboards. Um, we looked at replacing the oil fired boiler with an electric boiler. And then we looked at replacing that boiler with a combination of electric boiler and an air to water heat pump. Next. And in the end, we decided to go with the option that was least efficient because it was also the least disruptive to the tenants. Uh, so we went with the, uh, the mini splits plus uh, electric boiler. And um, that option also had the lowest cost of service and re replacement parts over the projected 60 years of the building. So we did do a total cost of building ownership analysis and we took the long view. We really um, reject the idea that we should be looking at short term uh, uh, return on investments when we're dealing with buildings which can have 50 plus lifespans. Next. And in terms of performance, the results uh, were modeling a heating demand of 19 kilowatt hours per meter square per year. And the cooling demand is actually the same. Uh, and this represents an emissions reduction of about 28 tons of CO2E annually. And over that 60 year lifespan of the building, it is an operation, there's an operational savings of one and a half million dollars. And the value of the building increases by $1.3 million based on the work not happening. Next. So, sorry, there's a lot of text on this slide. Uh, since phase one, which was the feasibility study, um, right after we finished that study, we had a webinar that we were shocked to um, that hundred over a hundred people across Canada uh, signed up for. And we've been actively fundraising for the pilot build and monitoring. Uh, we established Recover as a nonprofit organization. And we also established a very amazing advisory committee, some of whom are on this call. Uh, and then after all of that, after the dust settled, um, we, uh, we were sort of brought into conversations with a lot of organizations and people across Canada 
and um, started questioning the non-for-profit status. And so we're looking into setting up either a branch or a separate organization for profit. And we're also uh, looking not just at MERBs, um, really there are millions of buildings across Canada that need retrofits and we're not gonna limit our, uh, our projects to just MERBs. We've applied for a lot of grants, and both for uh, multi-unit residential buildings and for municipal buildings, and we're working on policies to ensure social equity. Next. And so all of those stars uh, are cities that we've had um, some of the more serious than others conversations with city staff, and in some of the the, we are pursuing funding to do municipal building retrofits. Next. And so in hindsight, because we have talked to thousands of people literally over the last year, um, we, we, in the pilot uh, feasibility study, we were really focused on developing a business case for that one retrofit. And now we're realizing that we need a business plan because there's huge demand for expertise in this area. And we're still muddling through our organizational structure questions. We are learning to have a lot of patience. We really, really just wanna do these buildings, but um, it takes a lot of time and money. Uh, and as we pivot to working with municipalities, we're really facing some big uh, questions about procurement and how we can do these kinds of projects and still work with the structure that is already established by municipalities for um, who they hire to do work. And we've learned that there are just so many people who are desperate to work on this prob problem and we're keen to work with all of you. And that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Lori. Very, very inspiring. So Beverly Craig from Mass CEC, you are up next. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, so great to hear so many incredible initiatives going on. Um, I work at the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, and we're a little bit like NYSERDA. We're a quasi-state governmental agency, but we're like the tiny piece of NYSERDA. NYSERDA is like us plus Mass Save, and Mass Save is like about 15 times as big as Mass CEC. So I would say like our role in Massachusetts is sort of to fill niches where nobody else is doing anything, and that's how we sort of got into this space. Um, We've been running what's called a triple decker design challenge. And yes, it does, Mary, sound like a food, doesn't it? But those of you who've been in uh, New England very long know what a triple decker is, which is it's sort of the original workforce housing in New England. It is three identical uh, units stacked on one, one another. It traditionally was sort of immigrant housing uh, built over 100 years ago. People like to joke about uh, it's the drunken sailors who put them together and they all are <laughs> somewhat unique. And uh, there's a lot of them in Massachusetts, um, about between 12,000 and 14,000 of them we know. And so why did we pick triple decks? We're really interested in the larger scale stuff that RMI is um, looking at in Massachusetts and that we really hope to look at. But we also want to look at something that sort of had the emotional resonance of a lot of people in Massachusetts. And so many people have lived in a triple decker and know they're terribly energy inefficient and they're very uncomfortable. So the average HERS rating um, of the buildings that we assessed were, were between 180 and 240 for starting. And the air infiltration, all of us are in the passive house world, was seven to eight times what it is for new construction stretch code in Massachusetts. So really uncomfortable, really high cost to start with. And so what we wanted to do was to sort of challenge architects and builders to come up with ideas for how to electrify this building so that we can be net zero by 2050. And um, we wanted also as part of this to take a look at whether we could change the financial model a little. Could we ever add a fourth unit, whether it be in the back on the side or above, so that there's additional value that could help underwrite the retrofit of the rest of it. 
So we put together uh, prizes, held this for about six months, and we did really encourage people to think about embodied carbon. I mean, obviously by saving an existing building, you're doing a huge amount of saving uh, for embodied carbon, but uh, we had uh, uh, builders for climate action sort of customize the tool that they have for triple deckers so that that could be used by all the applicants applying. And we did field 13 different proposals, nine which are just traditional retrofits of the existing square footage and four that did add an additional unit or proposed it. And if you are interested in the dirty uh, details, uh, I recommend you go to our website. Um, the bit.ly is there and it is case sensitive. If you put a lowercase d, you'll find triple decker buses. So make sure you get that right. Um, also on that web page, we did a sort of rollout of all the different proposals. The different applicants did three minute videos uh, and talked about their poster and some of the unique uh, portions of their design at a Boston Society for Architects um, that is, um, has been recorded. And Kevin O'Connor from This Old House did the intro because they are actually in the next season doing a retrofit of a triple decker in Mattapan. Next slide. So just to give you a sense, this is the one of the traditional retrofits. We have not actually announced the awards yet. It's hopefully coming very, very soon. But this is sort of a very typical, well, I wouldn't say necessarily typical. They're all very different. Um, but this one actually proposed different varieties of toolkits for retrofits. And the one that they actually picked to run the numbers on and everything did, did result in a 94% decrease in annual energy use, bringing the HERS rating from 174 to 11. And um, next slide. This is an example of one that added a unit to the back and uh, really exciting because actually quite a few, especially in the Boston metro area, do have sort of a backyard that's fairly underutilized. And we think this might be something that we can challenge communities in their next zoning rewrite to think about how they would make a simple process for adding an additional unit in exchange for reducing the energy use of the total building. Next slide. So we are, now that we have all these and we're going to be announcing the awards, uh, we're also trying to cull the best ideas from all those different proposals, uh, sort of run the modeling on all of them and sort of see what's the most important lessons that we can learn from that. So uh, we do know, like I mentioned, that the starting energy was terrible. Uh, from the modeling, uh, we can tell that the roof is probably the most critical piece here. It, and it's probably also the biggest departure from what happens right now when people right now are replacing that uh, flat roof, uh, they're basically just changing out the membrane, which is not changing the R value, the insulation value, the air tightness at all. And so getting the right recipe for a roof, whether it's a panelized version that has to be craned up there or maybe it's stick built, but making sure that we get that right and get that standard is super important to reducing the energy use. And because we're a part of the passive house community, we know that the air infiltration is a really important piece of that pie as well to making all electric operating costs to be a reasonable amount. Um, one thing that we seem to be finding from the initial uh, modeling is that we may not necessarily, like the energy sprung model is, is putting panels on everything. And we definitely think that needs to be done on bigger buildings, but we think this size may not actually need to do that. We may need to do, we may be able to do the zero over time approach where we, we wait for that siding when it needs to be replaced to put the exterior continuous on. So if we really focus on the most important pieces, we may be able to just sort of uh, wait and not, you know, the, the cost of a deep energy retrofit is what seems to get in the way. And if we can do pieces of it at a time, that's going to be a really great thing. Uh, solar on all of these totally made sense. In Massachusetts, it's often a five to eight year payback. And with a, basically then you've got free electricity. So that really reduces the cost of operating an all electric building. Uh, it also seems very fairly obvious that if you're going to be replacing the windows, that that it's really the premium's not that much higher for triple glazed and that that's probably a decision you should make and that our policy should be encouraging. Um, we did find, you know, the big challenge for selling somebody on the idea of 
solar on a building like this is there's this tenant landlord split and how do you like incorporate that in a green lease or something else but we do find an awful lot of these are sort of an asset of a single family so a lot of times initially it used to be one family and then their nephews were on the second floor and then a third relative was on the, the bottom floor. And over time, that building has stayed in one family's home and they rent out other floors. So it is pretty typical for there to be a, um, an owner occupant on one of those floors. And in that case, um, there were several models in the um, applicants that sort of showed if you can pay for that one unit's heating and cooling costs and cover some things on the common loads, and then that that would make sense. Next slide. And so we are putting together this white paper. I think in another three months or so, you'll be able to see sort of what our biggest conclusions are, including like the right recipe for the roof. Um, we the we um, are planning to come up with some incentive money to try and get around 20 of these actually built with about six of them adding an additional unit and of course the big money in massachusetts is around the mass save offering and right now that offering doesn't usually work real well with triple deckers it's very focused on single family in general so adapting it to this type of building and actually making that especially with the roof decisions the right decision is what we're trying to do um, and then also this idea of creating a zoning path for that fourth unit by uh, challenging localities to make that an easier thing for people instead of just a zone, instead of a zoning variance. So uh, I do encourage you to go to our website, take a look. Uh, uh, Kevin O'Connor was really quite funny. He lived in a triple decker as a student with a number of friends and <laughs> had some funny stories to tell. So thank you. Thank you, Bev. Um, I also lived in a triple decker as a as a student, so I'm I am excited to see this work. Uh, Naomi Beal from Passive House, Maine, you're up next. Thanks, Zach. It's great to be here. You can just go ahead and go into the first slide. Yep, I'm Naomi, the ED of Passive House, Maine, and I'm talking about 50 Houses, which is our kind of research arm of an organization that promotes um, Passive House in general, go ahead to the next slide. Um, so uh, the 50 Houses Research Initiative um, came about when there were two uh, concepts sort of collided for me at about the same time. One was the energy sprung model that we've already um, heard a lot about. And what struck me about the energy sprung model was not necessarily their approaches to masonry row houses that they have in Holland, but just the fact that they identified a very specific problem. How do we renovate this type of building? And then they set about in a very deliberate way to find a solution. And so um, at about the same time, I heard about energy sprung in Maine, we had a study that um, done by the Island Institute, which examined that rural energy gap, that problem of small isolated communities on islands or in rural um, parts of Maine, Vermont, and Alaska were all included in that study. And just uh, acknowledging the lack of resources, lack of materials, lack of trained builders, lack of components, lack of interested architects or designers and lack of funds to really uh, create efficient, comfortable um, additions to existing building stock, such as what we have in Maine. And so the whole point about 50 houses is that we looked at really main kind of buildings, single families, duplexes, and we also have those triple deckers in our mill towns too. Um, so the original idea was actually to take 50, literally to take 50 houses from a very tiny uh, town way in the north of Maine, um, an old, a mill town in which the mill had actually shut down. And we were gonna renovate 
50 houses with a big budget for that time. We had um, an idea that it would be $5.5 million to do 50 buildings, create some kind of microgrid with some local hydro um, power that we had up there. And I had academic partners. So it was really like a research project focused on these small wooden underbuilt um, homes that we could buy for really, really cheap, like 15,000, maybe $30,000. And to, um, to demonstrate and improve our approaches to renovation. But almost immediately I ran into barriers and um, then it, it just like bore out the whole rural energy gap problem in real time in that moment. And that, well, the biggest question was, well, who's gonna own these buildings when we're done and how will they possibly get paid for? Because we were thinking about buying very cheap buildings almost 20% of that town was vacant at that point. Um, but the, the question was who was actually going to buy them because it's a very depressed real estate market. If we were to add however much, what would that be? 60, 70, $100,000 into those buildings, who would possibly buy them? Um, and, and yeah, and who was going to pay for them in, the, in general? It was just like a literal example of why it's difficult to renovate small homes in rural places. So a vision that I had was that Maine could help demonstrate and then there would be applicability across Maine, but across New England, across all of a lot of Canada, um, the Halifaxes, uh, housing stock is a lot like ours, but also even um, in northern Scandinavia, Russia, there's a lot of houses like this around the world. And as much as um, Energy Sprung works for much of the city and urban areas and appropriately is paying attention to those kind of buildings, what Maine needs is attention to these small single family homes. How are we actually going to renovate 550 units, which is what we've got in the state, um, in order to reach our the state stated uh, carbon goals. So um, we kind of stepped away from focusing only on this small town three hours north of where I am, and I'm just north of Portland. And we uh, moved we looked at some other buildings that were a little bit closer and a little more manageable. You want to go ahead and change that slide, Zach? So we, we kind of, um, through a variety of connections, came across this building, which is owned by um, a housing authority. And we, we made the connections, we got some cost assessments, we did some fundraising for um, the 50 houses, which is basically administrative, and um, sort of set our, our hat on this inaugural project, which was great. And as far as the process went, but as soon as we got an actual quote of how much it might cost to do a uh, panelized carbon negative with our local wood fiber insulation, vision, um, it, it just kind of shut down. Like the housing authorities just couldn't even think about it. The local um, housing co-op uh, just were like, you know, we'd love to do it, but there's just no way we could possibly justify the cost. It's such a common problem. So that's actually relatively new for us. Just before um, the holidays, we realized that we were having some um, real challenges with this particular building. In the interim, we've also were developing what we're calling this open source database, which is a collection of case studies of single family duplexes or triple deckers um, renovations so that we can sort of collect those examples in, a, in one place that can be accessed by anybody who's doing similar projects. So we have started um, that process. Um, go ahead to that next slide, Zach. 
we have a second building that we're looking at, which is, um, you know, sort of moving forward. This is part of a living building community <clears throat> challenge project. The Ecology School in Southern Maine, they've built a couple of dorms and some um, um, community center new build to living building challenge, but the existing farmhouse on that property also needs to be retrofitted to passive house standard. So we are working with that school. We're um, helping set up some monitoring to do some pre-construction monitoring. Um, during this phase, we're also um, firming up some details of a report that we started um, a good 12 months ago, actually, that can, that's trying to make a definitive case in favor of a deep energy retrofit rather than weatherization, which is where the state seems to have come down. State of Maine is focusing on weatherization and heat pumps as their approach to um, reaching our carbon goals for our existing buildings. Um, and then the other part that we're working on that's really coming quite close at this point is that database I just want to double check to make sure I'm not forgetting something else that I want to say on this page. I was quite literal about doing a short um, presentation. So we have um, this project in the works. Go ahead to that next slide. Thanks, Zach. And this is um, the homepage of retrofit-research.org, which is Passive House Maine's 50 Houses Research. Um, retrofit research side page um, and on this page we have access to a survey which is how we are collecting our um, case studies that survey was um, created refined refined again and refined some more we feel pretty good about it right now um, and we are actively collecting case studies we have four that have sort of been our placeholders for the last year and um, the expression of the data on the other end that page is not yet released but with more data points it will make a little more sense and be a little more complete so we are at this point actively asking for um, and looking for more case studies so if there's anybody on this call who has a passive house level retrofit and want to share it with um, with us at Passive House Maine, but it's also then available to everyone. Um, get in touch with me, uh, and I'll forward you on to our intern, Sebastian, who I think is on this call. He's a U University of Maine Orono Econ student who's helping us get at least, we're looking for 20 case studies in the next couple of months to fill in to that um, database. So I think that is where we are for right now. Fantastic. Thanks. Thank you, Naomi. You're welcome. Yeah, I, I, that's uh, good, good uh, important questions you're raising and, and important work. So um, Michael, I think, I think it's time for you to take it away. Great, thanks, Zach. And uh, those, are, those are great. Uh, I, this is, uh, I think, what everybody is looking for, just kind of everything in one spot. And uh, it's a good snapshot of kind of where we are. Uh, this question is actually, uh, if everybody can just take like a, a minute or two answering it themselves, uh, Beverly, maybe we'll start with you. But uh, we, we had a, a few questions come in that were really similar, which is really um, comes down to uh, what do you feel are the easiest items uh, that could make the biggest difference in meeting your goals? You know, what, what are the what are the things you need to have to really happen right now to kind of help things happen? And what, what do you, where do you, what do you see as the hurdles and, and the opportunities? So everyone can take a minute or two asking and Beverly, we'll start with you. It came up during yours, so I figured you'd be first. Well, it's hard to say that. Like, I don't, I honestly think there needs to be both, on retrofits, there needs to be a carrot and a stick. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, for triple-decker retrofits, we need our mass safe program to be much more generous 
and especially with the places that count most around air tightness, better windows when people are replacing the windows that that upgrade and really that roof recipe. So it needs to be a cohesive and specific for multifamily to do all three units at once, not this one by one by one. It just doesn't work. But at the mm -hmm. same time, we need to have the stick part. So we need municipalities to say it's just not acceptable to replace the membrane exactly as it is without doing a roof right. And those two have to be put together. Cool. Thanks. James, you want to go next? Sorry, I, I muted myself and just realized after the fact. <laughs> so the, the question is, where are the opportunities? Yeah, what, what are the what are the what are the uh, what's the low hanging fruit? What are the easiest opportunities? What uh, what what could people do right now? Or if they're not doing it, what what should they do? Like, what's the easiest thing that we just need people to do right now? What, what's so, the biggest thing we could do? So I think one of them is for that company that's the solution provider that's going to deliver a whole thing to have long term contracts with manufacturers so that they're designing a product together. Um, it's not a, they're not thinking about a one off. They're thinking about a multi multiple year process where they continually think about how to do plug and play, um, how to how to speed up the installation process, cut down the construction interest and so forth. Um, I think um, for portfolio owners, um, not hiring a GC and then having that person manage the project, you mm -hmm. know, you know, have a higher company that's going to put a warranty behind the product. Um, sense. So um, yeah, those are the, those are kind of the two big ones. Um, and then I think also, I mean, it's not low hanging fruit, but I just feel like I have to throw it out there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, energy is cheap. Um, it's going to be cheap for the foreseeable future. Um, so like we need to like start doing a full, every angle assault, on um, monetizing air quality. So let people know about the health benefits, document the passive houses we have and get people to disclose their experience, um, support research, uh, work on getting the Medicaid funding to building owners for, for lowering, um, for, for basically uh, reducing the avoidable health healthcare costs. So that's that's the opposite of what you're asking. So that's the hard <laughs> one, but like, you know, <laughs> that's what comes to mind. Cool. Betsy? Yeah, um, you know, hearkening back to, we're really a policy think tank. So yeah, we want a carrot and a stick. Um, we want a cap on carbon and we want a price on carbon. Um, we're seeing some leadership at the municipal levels. Vancouver's uh, in the middle of adopting a, a carbon cap and, and phasing it in, and they're not the first to do it in North America. We have a bit of a different model in, um, in Canada where most of our municipalities don't have the authority to do that. And so we'd rather see it at the provincial level if not the national level. Um, but we have a lot of first steps. So there's a lot of questions around what are these costs? We don't really know. Um, and we're really trying to identify what is that, that gap. Um, mm -hmm. We know that there's, there's something that needs to be covered. We don't quite know what it is. And so we need to know that so that we can inform governments on what the, you know, the scale of the problem really is. And maybe that informs the price on carbon. So. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Right. So we're looking for case studies too, please. Um, who wants to go next, Brett, Laurie? Sure, I can. I can jump in. Uh, I uh, yeah. I agree with a lot of what's been said. I think, um, additionally, I, I maybe I just want to echo one of the points that Bev made around realigning incentives to not incentivize specific technologies, but incentivize um, whole building retrofit approaches, like we know from some of our preliminary pilots and costing analysis we are the gap is 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 big right now <laughs> like we're mm -hmm. not like we're far from being able to say this is going to pencil for every building owner to do one of these zero carbon retrofits in the very near term future and so we know we're going to need that capital boost to make this initial cohort of projects go and one way, one avenue to get there um, in the immediate term seems like if we can get, you know, the incentives to align with the whole building approach and have it be a dollar per 
I think actually I may have gotten this from Bev herself, but get, have a dollar per GHG avoided type of metric or something like that, um, that would help structure the, um, help, help tip the scales for a lot of these initial projects. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Uh, who wants to go next? Oh, well, maybe we'll go to the next one. Um, I mean, so the next one really is about financing. Uh, and again, I'm going to pose it to whoever wants to answer it. Uh, we'll, we'll let you guys answer it and then keep it to a couple of minutes. But financing has come up over and over again in multiple different ways. Uh, do we think financing is going to catch up? How much um, does financing really play a key role um, uh, and subsidizing um, uh, projects uh, at the beginning because we're going to need um, potential subsidizing so that the market can catch up. So who, anybody who wants to, to jump into that, we talked about it a little bit just now, but anybody who wants to kind of continue with that, uh, jump in. I'll say that in Maine, there's a lot of talk about green banks and low interest um, funding. I still, uh, I'm not convinced that that's gonna be the, um, tipping point for a lot of these projects. Um, and I really, I really think that concrete investment and in research has to be part of this formula first before we can try to make a, you know, a real ROI argument. Um, got it. So, I mean, this is a topic that I, you know, sort of think endlessly about. Um, I want to say that I, I think that, um, what you know there, there are a lot of moving parts here um first of all when you get a warranty you'll get more debt you'll get more equity on the table um just slight digression you know one thing we can do immediately is we can all never use the phrase payback period again in our lifetimes um and start referring to net present value um which actually records the impact on valuation which should not be discounted that's to me mm -hmm. just an absurdity um um, the other thing about financing is while there needs to be for early pipeline development, some kind of gap funding or some kind of subsidy funding, what one thing that's massively needed, once you switch a business model, um, away from the current business model and you have a single entity that produces these, um, these retrofits, um, you get a lot, you get the advantage of a lot of efficiencies. So really what's required to get these entities off the ground and some plant and equipment grants for plant and equipment um, mm -hmm. is really necessary. And when you look at the amazing projects coming out of the ABC collaborative, you know, sponsored by the DOE, um, the, the question I come away when I think about those things, because there's so many great technologies that are needed is the companies that need to use them, how are they going to afford them, right? And, mm -hmm. and if there is plant and equipment funding from the federal or state governments or from nonprofits, then those companies can suck them right up and those costs are gonna come way down like immediately. I'm not saying they're where they're gonna need to be ultimately, but they will mm -hmm. take a extreme haircut like from day one, just when those technologies are in, are in place. So that's, that's my thought, financing. Cool. All right, so now we'll get the questions individually. Uh, so um, when I call on you, hopefully I gave you enough notice. I've only given two people notice so far, uh, but uh, you, you can just jump in and ask the question yourself. Um, Dan from APCO, you could be first. I think you had a question for Betsy about uh, um, uh, Energy Sprung and, uh, and, and how tall the buildings were. Yeah, thanks, Michael. And thanks everybody, this has been phenomenal. Um, but yeah, my, my question was basically, um, What's the tallest building that you've seen successfully implement that energy sprung approach, at least thus far? So, you know, I don't know that I'm the best person to, to answer that question, but energy sprung is really focused on row housing uh, and that's, that's kind of where they, they kind of stuck. Um, we're looking at sort of four stories and down and I suspect James or um, Brett might be better uh, to talk about that because I think that they're looking at more mid rise. Uh, so I would, I would suspect that, if, you know, we're seeing some of these solutions at a, at a mid rise level. They look a little bit differently then they're sort of pieced together in that case, not like the, 
basically kind of the magic. Here's a new facade, the way that Energy Sprung is, is sort of sexy in their uh, their panel technology. Um, but so when you start to think about it in pieces like that, you think, oh, well, then it doesn't really entirely matter because you're going to be hanging off of the, you know, the floor beams anyway. So, um, but Brett, maybe you might have an answer. To sure. Yeah. So uh, the tallest building that I've seen personally uh, is not a building yet. I know that in the Netherlands, there have been successful energy sprung style demonstrations on, I think, you know, a four to seven story buildings that have a similar approach with the, um, with the, you know, overclad exterior retrofit panel. Um, so they have successfully demonstrated those sort of mid-rise solutions there. Um, next question, um, Sarah, uh, Sarah Dooling, uh, if you want to jump in, you had a question for Lori on uh, social equity. Oh, I'll jump in. Um, Sarah asked, uh, what kind of policies uh, are being into place to ensure social equity? Lori, I think you started to talk about it when that when that question came up. Um, but uh, and and anybody, anyone can bring this up as well. I mean, I, I think it's a it's an important topic. So uh, anyone who's got mm -hmm. Uh, some some items to talk about here can can jump in yeah. as well. Um, so we we kind of have um, two branches of the conversations about social equity right now. Um, we have our internal conversation, you know, conversations right now. I mean, recover is three people. We we talk a big talk, but we're you know we're really tiny. Um, but we're working hard to ensure that as we go forward, we work with. Uh, diverse contractors that we work in communities that are, uh, you know, in Black and Indigenous communities, and that we have fair representation in the kinds of projects that we do. And then on the other side of it, we actually have a document that um, essentially it's a contract that we have had the landlords sign that um, they essentially promises that they won't raise the rent after the project is done. And there's a number of other conditions, but essentially it protects the tenants, uh, not just from rent eviction, but from any kind of negative consequences that might happen as a result of their building becoming fancier. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm getting that. So Mor Morali, you are next. You had a question for James. Sorry. Hi. Um, yes. Um, I was just curious about whether in New York City specifically uh, there have been allowances made to the building and energy uh, code um, or zoning um, to allow for th things like any energy sprung, which could encroach onto sidewalks and such. Yeah, you know, it's a great question. I don't know the answer to it. I know, you know, we have a team that's focused on um, on building code, and I know the mayor's office of New York City is working on it, but I, I actually don't know um, um, where that stands right now. I do know that we have a project um, with NYCHA that's, that's taking off um, now, um, and that doesn't seem to be an issue, but uh, yeah, I don't know where code stands right now. Can I have a quick follow-up? Yeah, go for it. Just curious, um, is there something that we can follow to keep up with this? Because that's, you know, that's a big, a lot of building stock there, and that'd be great to to bring this into the, you know, fold. Yeah, I, if you shoot me an email, I'll I'll try to connect you with um, the people that are involved in code in NYSERDA. Okay, thank you. Um, so I am sorry, but I don't know. The, I, I didn't write down the person's name who uh, 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 asked this question, but uh, both uh, Naomi and Beverly came up with both of your uh, presentations, which is just um, in the triple deckers, uh, the ventilation uh, between units and, and just air sealing between the units and just the noise between units, I guess, uh, several times came up. And if uh, you wanted to talk about that and just in, in that building stock, I'm going to put a second question on that as well, which was asked by two or three other people kind of in the chat, which is um, how does historic preservation play a role in some of these buildings? Because uh, obviously some of them will be in districts where um, that, that'll matter quite a bit. So uh, either one of you can, can jump in on that. 
So triple decker is definitely, um, is my audio on? Yep. Okay. Um, triple deckers right now <laughs> have a lot of air between units. You know, you mm -hmm. smell your neighbor cooking and smoking and whatever they're doing. And there's basically no effort to compartmentalize at all. So I think that is part of when we talk about advanced air sealing and part of why the expense is there, it's around that. We do find a lot of chimneys that you don't need to use anymore, which interestingly enough, you can take out and then use for uh, as a chase potentially, um, or at least you can close it off because that's one of the big places where you do get a lot of air infiltration. Um, but that is something we recognize. I mean, there's only so much you can do about noise between units, but <laughs> if you focus on the air, uh, the air infiltration, that's going to help a lot. Great. Thanks. Um, Jeremy, you, uh, you want to jump in? You just, you just had a good question. Yeah, thanks, Michael. I was just um, wondering, with all of these exterior retrofits, which are really beautiful and compelling, um, how are, you know, a lot of the, we work on a lot of old buildings in Philadelphia, and there's never a point at which we don't find structural issues or rot or mold or asbestos, and we usually just find all of this stuff. Um, bugs in the walls, all kinds of stuff, and just bad design decisions that need to be covered up or uncovered, whatever. So how, how do these exterior, don't, don't they, um, inc you know, you're, aren't you just encasing folks in this uh, stuff? Uh, or like, how do you guys think about this? And not, not just, um, you know, not how you handle it, but how do you think about thinking about this, right? Uh, can I, I mean, it's a huge question. And then there's basement, mm -hmm. and I won't talk about that. I can jump in and throw out a couple ideas. Hi, Jeremy. I think um, we're running into some of this on in our California work on some of the pilot demonstrations where the amount of structural remediation that needs to be done to even support a four pound per square foot panel is um, substantial. And so I think there is, and so some of that may be like, well, if you had an independent structural panel that could go on that building and uh, help give it the seismic retrofit that it needs anyways, and uh, and give it this new facade and, and energy performance could solve some of that. I think to your question, there is a point at which, you know, we need to think about like, what are the buildings worth retrofitting? and we haven't done much of that analysis, maybe other folks have, but um, versus tearing down and building again. I mean, I do think that is a, is a factor with some of the oldest building stock. Yeah. Um, so that's my thought on the structural side. On some of the mold and pest side, um, we've done less work there. So I'll, I'll let other folks weigh in on that one. I would just build on what Brett's saying. I mean, none of these can be done without an, an understanding of what, what's going on inside. And, you know, maybe the question isn't as extreme as, does, is this a teardown? Maybe it's a, is this the right, you know, is an exterior retrofit right? Um, if you need to get into the interior to do some remediation anyway, then that might be your best um, uh, best approach. So they're, they're fair questions. Even though we've identified our buildings, we still don't know what we're, we're really going to run into when we actually start, um, you know, assessing them. Um, I just want to jump in. So we have started, we haven't, I wouldn't say it's finished, but we're working on a facility assessment kind of checklist so that we can evaluate whether or not a building is appropriate for uh, uh, an energy sprong like uh, retrofit. And on the other, on the mold and air quality side of things, I don't think anybody's going to be able to do any of these kinds of projects without addressing or upgrading or introducing new ventilation. And so by and large, people are going to actually be better off if these spaces have contaminants existing in them um, after the fact than before. Hmm. I will say on triple deckers too, there's like the added complication that with the hundred year old buildings, the electrical and plumbing is often in terrible shape. And you don't want to just air seal that up. You really need to deal with it, which is why a lot of the costs were very high on the proposals that we saw. 
but I think that's an acknowledgement that at some point this has to be done. So if you can make the incentives high enough and a loan product that is, uh, you know, like we have a 0% heat loan for energy efficiency work. If it could be for things that enable you to be electrification ready, then uh, that would be great. Like that, I think that's a way to potentially get those kinds of upgrades, even if they're done slowly over time. Hmm. Hey, one thing I was gonna add, we've done it in some of our projects, uh, although none of them are what I would call affordable, but, uh, but they're still helpful because sometimes they have a not to exceed uh, budget. Um, sometimes what we've done is uh, included uh, a 10% contingency that's that's within the budget, um, but that the contractor still has to earn, con contractor still has to put change orders in for that, but it helps the client um, get the right amount of funding because we know in the old buildings we work in, we, we know we're going to find stuff. Uh, it's guaranteed. And I guess if we were to do the same building over and over again, which we don't, but if we were, I guess you'd start to see an average of of what those problems could be and you'll see whether 10 percent is the right number or if it's something else but it would help to budget it and again the contractor can't just take it as their own cushion it's got to be earned but um it's just a thought uh, about whether it would work in uh in, in in this kind of building type any, any thoughts on that anybody i mean I, I the way i look at this is is that you know we try you try to reduce the variables on site and mm -hmm. there's a there's a limitation to what you could do there um, and mm -hmm. to where you can't reduce the variables you have basically a la carte items right structural damage abatement um, mm -hmm. and but the th but the, when you look at those structure elements or abatement um, when you compare a conventional you know we're trying to get a building owner to make a decision and that decision is a comparison between two alternatives and the there's a wash between conventional upgrade and zero energy retrofit for mm -hmm. abatement issues or structural issues. They have to solve them anyway, really. So if if that's a cost, that's a cost. It doesn't create a larger delta for adoption of zero energy retrofit. But if it's capital intensive, in fact, that might be favorable to zero energy retrofit because you do the work and then you might get 10 years of long, additional longevity to mm -hmm. pay for to pay for those costs. So, um, so that's one way I, I look at it, you know, there's, you know, and then the next question is just like, how efficiently can we like discover those structural um, mm -hmm. requirements? Makes sense. So, um, well, RV, James, you don't, oh, sorry, yeah. go ahead. I was just gonna get, I'm sorry, Michael, James, it just doesn't seem you efficiently uncover structural things. You find them and then you find more. I, I hate to be pessimistic, but we find a lot of this stuff on retrofit. So I know it I just think feels like we're not dealing with that. Pessimism is a great way to find the problem that needs to be solved. So um, um, there is a technology now to use radar to that can look through a building um, by how long you put that radar on. It can look all the way through the building, but you put it on for a short period of time and it uses radar to find um, the structural integrity of the building. So that's what I mean by efficiently, as opposed to having a person like pull down sheetrock and stuff like that. Right, so thank you. I appreciate yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you. That's, no, cool. so that's it, different. So absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do think that Thanks, when, we, when we take a look at the retrofit projects, we, we are very often finding these issues in the first 10% of the job timing wise. I mean, you're finding out within the first couple of weeks right after demo. It's rare that you're finding these, these things out unless you're doing demo slowly, uh, like a phased project. Um, but, um, and even those you'll find them in the same spot. I do think, especially if someone was doing the same project type over and over again, I think you could start to actually um, you do the math and, and, and come up with some probably pretty responsible numbers. It, it's just my, my take on, on that. But I mean, again, uh, we'd, we'd have to see how that goes. Uh, Harvey, you're, uh, you're next on the, on, on the list. You had a few, but uh, choose one or two. Well, Harvey, we'll come back to you if you're muted. He needs uh, to no, unmute sorry, himself. Sorry, my, uh, my mic wasn't working. Um, there you go. And I finally got it. Yeah, I would have come back to you, I Michael, promise. That's a great question for tomorrow night on T3 for technology. Mm -hmm. so save that for tomorrow. All right. Yeah, but no, my, my, my thing was, you know, real estate is location, location, location. And I think after hearing everybody who did a fabulous job tonight, to me, it just seems like it's incentive, incentive, incentive. Because it's going to come down to the financial. And so it's almost like, and I say this very loosely, it's like the nerds need to meet uh, the chip heads because it's mm -hmm. got to be 
it's got to come up with something from a Wall Street angle for a financing that the governments can jump on. It's finance outside. It's tradable. Something has to come that way to make it make some sense of it. I you know I threw something in about if you have capex and then you, it, depending on how how much your energy uh, your energy load drops, that'll tie into how much you would have a rebate on taxes. So I'm just using that as a basis, but really I think it's going to have to come down to incentives. And other than that, you know, James, you were saying that you you've talked with some owners. Uh, other than the fact that what's in it for them to do this other than longevity like there's got to be a reason and it's got to be a compelling reason because i think that the one up in canada that they did this massive retrofit on they were spending three or four million dollars and it really the numbers just didn't make any sense for that uh along the way so i'm just wondering where the incentives are going to come from and what the think tanks are what you guys are thinking or, or where it's gonna where that's gonna land and and again thanks for for this has been a great uh, presentation tonight thank you um so before we get to the next questions i'm going to throw it back to zach real quick big thank you to mary james for organizing tonight and to michael ingui for moderating and for all of our fine panelists for their presentations really really appreciate everybody's contributions on what is such a vitally important topic for us to be engaging with. Um, I also wanna do another shout out to our sponsors who make this work possible. Um, and uh, just really uh, lots of gratitude toward these companies for, for their support of the Accelerator. And especially a big shout out to Zola Windows, our founding, or a, a, our founding sponsor, actually our very first sponsor at the Accelerator and also tonight's summit sponsor 